it's time for COVID-19 360. You are warmly welcome. Of course, we are live on TV3 and also you can find us on BSTV channel 279. Join us via social media as well. And let us know what you think about the increase in case count, the various issues that have creeped up as a result of COVID-19. Now, first up, this morning we started a conversation uh, from the KNUST Senior High School where a student has lost his life. Now, there are various rumors going around and one of them is the fact that this student unfortunately was not seen to by the teachers and the headmistress because they suspected that he had COVID-19 and so he was picked up by his father later and unfortunately it was reported that he had passed on. There is no confirmation as to whether he indeed passed on as a result of COVID-19 uh, but when we spoke to Ibrahim Abubakar earlier he mentioned that this would be the seventh death that the school has recorded this year and so they're attributing it to some <laughs> spiritual attack we're not sure but we'll cross over to ken usd again uh to find out from ibrahim what's the latest update especially because uh the gs uh, secretariat had also made an appearance there so again that and more we'll talk about factories and the likelihood of that being the hot spots for a lot of infections for covid 19 as well so you're welcome and my name is Bella Mundi. She's back, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> yes, my name is Anita Ekia Kufu. And yesterday, as at the time we came your way with COVID-19, 360, our case count in terms of number of cases that had been added were 992. But 11 hours down the line, that is as of yesterday down the line, uh, 891 new cases have been recorded again and that is just for this week and we're not even you know uh, to the end of the week and these are the figures we're recording down here in Ghana but when we get to the global front Brazil is in the news as Brazil's president uh, for the four time testing he's now been confirmed as having COVID-19 and he's one person who has flouted all the protocols and all the regulations and so it comes as not a shock to many people because it was actually expected much earlier but he's tested four times and the fourth time he's been confirmed as positive and so when we get into the figures on the global front I'll be giving you more details on that but like Bella mentioned we have a, a packed show for you by you at home you can get interactive with us via social media pages and also our WhatsApp number with all your thoughts and comments, Bella. I mean, I'm really not surprised that he tested positive. <laughs> I was expecting it at one point or the other. But anyway, I hope you're feeling better now. Oh, I am. I Absolutely, am. yeah? I okay. Am. <laughs> anyway, so remember that sometime when the Minister of Trade joined the press briefing to update us on the protocols to be adhered to in the various companies, he did mention something that was very critical, that one of the hotspots uh, for the rapid spread of COVID-19 is the workplace. Over the past few days or so, we have received statements from various institutions indicating that some individuals had tested positive and as a result, they were in isolation and so a lot of the workers had to stay away. I remember on the 6th of July, uh, there was a statement from BOST and they also said that it had closed down its head office due to COVID-19. And just to refresh your memory, it said here that the bulk of uh, bulk oil storage and transport uh, company limited boss would like to announce uh, the information of the general public that it has closed down its head office at Jolie in the Yawaso West Municipality from the Monday the 6th of July to Monday the 13th of July and this has become necessary due to a mass testing uh, of staff carried out by the company at the head office in the wake of a staff at the IT department testing positive for the virus and then also there was a release from Coco Board and they also indicated that as a result of someone testing positive, they had to also, um, you know, shut down some of their offices as well. Now we've received another statement, and this is from the Ministry of Finance. This time around, no one has tested positive, but they're saying that uh, while we wait for the testing team to compile the comprehensive results, all staff are to work from home effective immediately. Staff who test positive will be duly informed and will receive the necessary care from the appropriate health authorities designated by the Ministry of Health. In addition, the necessary contact tracing will be undertaken by the appropriate authorities and staff will be duly informed about the appropriate dates to return to work. It also says that in view of the preparations towards the mid-year budget review, a core team of staff will work from approved locations to complete the mid-year review. All other staff will work from home using the ministry's approved digital channels and will continue to strongly advise uh, staff to adhere to the safety protocols. And so there's been a need for them to also stay away from the offices. 
And uh, yesterday we reported that Senior Minister Yao Osafo-Mafu had tested positive and had commenced treatment. So a number of things are happening. A lot more people are getting infected. And so as um, you know, we continue to educate, we want to remind you to continue wearing your nose mask, wash your hands under running water with soap. It's important. And also make sure that you have some hand sanitizer. But stay away from people as much as you can. Uh, we'll cross over now to, um, well, before that, I think Anita will do... Okay, so I did mention that we're crossing over to the KNUST to speak to Ibrahim Abubakar, but that will be uh, shortly. This time around, we're speaking to Frederick Ohinit Menta. He's the Chief Inspector of Factories at the Department of Factories and Inspectorates, Ministry of Employment and Labor Relations. And this is in, uh, with regards to the uh, messages that I read, the statement as well. So we'll try and connect with him. I don't know if he's ready. Frederick, are you ready for us? Frederick? Hello, Frederick. Okay, uh, we'll try and reconnect with him. But let's take a look at Ghana's case counts. We've recorded an increase. Yes, and so 891 Hello. new cases. Okay, I think Frederick okay. is back. Okay, Frederick is back. Hello, Hello. Frederick. Good morning. Frederick, good, good morning. Good morning, madam. How are you? Good morning. Yeah, fine. And you? We're fine, thank you. Frederick, if you can just position your camera so we can see your face. Yes. Okay. Perfect. Okay. I think this is fine. Okay. Yes, this is perfect. Thank you for joining us on COVID-19 360. And we are just reading some statements from a okay. number of companies, um, you know, concerning infections. I'm not hearing you well, please. Okay. You know what? We'll, we'll try and reconnect if you can't hear me. Hello, Frederick. All right. Anita, Hello? we'll do the case count and we'll see if we can reconnect with Frederick. Sure. And so like I was saying, 891 new cases have been recorded within the past 11 hours and 992 new cases were recorded as at the time we came your way with the Tuesday edition of COVID-19 360. And so confirmed cases this morning is at 21,968 with recoveries or discharges at 17,156 and then deaths at 129. When we look at the active cases, we now have 4,683. And as at Monday, the active cases were a little over uh, 5,000. And so meaning that more recoveries or discharges have been made. And even though we're recording more cases as well, the active cases are quite less. And for the gender distribution, more males are still recording uh, the infections or COVID-19 as compared to the females. And so the distribution is more 57% for the males and then 43% for the females. When we come to the case count per region from highest to lowest, the greater Accra region, now over 12,000 cases the Greater Accra region with 12,087 confirmed cases, the Ashanti region with 4,627, Western region 1,932, very close to the 2,000 mark, the Central region with 1,017, and then these are the top four regions in the over 1,000 mark, and then the Eastern region follows with 853, and then Volta region 370. Now let's look at some of the regions that are, are recording the lowest uh, so far. That is below 100. And we have the Buna region with 87, Upper West region 58, Savannah region 50, Ahafu region 26, and then the Northeast region with 8. Now still on the Ghana Health Service website, it gives us a summary of recoveries region by region. That is from March to July. And so it starts off with the Ahafu region and it goes all the way. And so when you visit the Ghana Health Service website, it gives you the total number of cases, number of recoveries, uh, uh, the percentage when it comes to how well we are doing in terms of the recoveries or discharges and also the active cases. It gives you a table of everything you need to know and also the various maps and which areas are recording the highest. Also, it gives you the date sample was taken and then the number. So if you are very interested in, you know, graphs and following everything that has been happening in Ghana with regard to our case count, this is the place to be. But now let's take a look at the number of tests that have been done so far. And we have 316,798 tests so far. And out of that, 21,968 have been confirmed as positive. And so for the routine surveillance, 115,547 tests 
have been confirmed for the contact tracing 201,000, 251,000 tests have been done and so out of that figure 13,088 were confirmed as positive and for the routine surveillance 115,547 tests were done with 8,880 being confirmed as positive and so this is basically how our case count is looking like with six critical cases five on ventilator and 22 severe cases but mr frederick is back and yes. Bella will be taking over from here yes, exactly and we're talking about the over five companies that have confirmed um covid 19 cases in the institutions from the media to factories you remember that there was a time when etema uh, factory recorded 500 cases as a result of one super spreader and so we want to find out from mr frederick uh, what work has gone into ensuring that we curtail this problem, especially because the Trade Minister has mentioned that our institutions are gradually becoming the hotspots for COVID-19 spread. And so again, Mr. Frederick Ohinemensa is the Chief Inspector of Factories at the Department of Factories Inspectorate, Ministry of Employment and Labour Relations. Good morning, Mr. Frederick. Good morning. Can you hear me? You have muted your sound, so if you can just quickly check and unmute your sound, please. Can you just click on your sound button? Yes, you have, it shows here that you've muted, so we can't hear you. Okay, or else your earpiece is not fully connected to your phone. Otherwise, just take the earpiece out. If you can take your earpiece out so we just connect with you directly. Um, just disconnect it from your phone. Disconnect the earpiece from your phone, sir. Okay, we're still having a bit of a challenge because it still says here that it's, it's muted. Uh, okay. Um, we'll, we'll cross over to Anita again. And like I said, KNUSD SHS is trending and so... Uh, we'll be bringing you some more updates with our correspondent, Ibrahim Abubakar, shortly. Uh, but Anita, again, we'll see if we can connect with Mr. Fred. Sure. And so we're looking at our case count in Africa. And as you can see on the COVID Africa dashboard, we have 509,767 confirmed cases on the African continent. And out of that, 8,567 healthcare workers have been affected. Deaths over 12,000 and that is 12,007 deaths on the African continent, with recoveries at 246,320. And South Africa taking that huge jump, that is over 200,000 cases. And this morning, they have 215,855 confirmed cases in South Africa. And when it comes to the number of cases in South Africa, it has more than doubled over the past two weeks, with the Western Cape contributing the highest when it comes to the figures in South Africa. That is 70,938 cases in just that province. And out of that as well, they're having more deaths as well in the Western Cape. And so that particular province is a, a, a very huge problem, especially when it comes to the management and containment of the virus in South Africa. And so let's go to Egypt where they have 77,279 confirmed cases. And Egypt recorded 969 new cases in the past 24 hours. And the health ministry is saying that their figures has, has dropped below 1,000 because initially they were recording more than 1,000 and you know, above 5,000 within just 24 hours. So they think their figures is gradually dropping. Now let's go to Nigeria, which is the third highest with 29,789 confirmed cases in Nigeria. That is over 150,000 uh, tests or samples have been taken and tested so far. And so I'll pause at this point and then uh, throw it back to Bella to continue the conversation All with right. Mr. Frederick, and then afterwards I continue. All right. Mr. Hinemansa, good morning again. Yeah, good morning. All right. Thank you very much. We're fine now. So we're talking about companies yeah. that have recovered COVID-19 cases and i want us to narrow this conversation exactly. to factories so so far how many factories yeah. have confirmed cases um at the moment as i'm speaking um there hasn't been any confirmed cases to my knowledge as of now okay maybe by the close of day or tomorrow we might have some cases but as of now there hasn't been any confirmed cases from the government of COVID-19. No, but I mean, we've received statements from a number of companies as well. I mean, the first one was from uh, the, the factory in Tema, 
that recorded over 500 cases. Mm -hmm. And that was a while back. CocoBot yeah. has also released a statement yeah. indicating that someone has tested positive. And so that's why I was asking yeah. if you have a full uh, figure yeah. for us as to how many of these companies have tested. But if not, tell us, uh, have you been visiting these companies and what has it been like so far? Yeah. I've come up, in fact, with the, there are a ministry that has been shut down, that means of that has been shut down. Um, but we don't have figures as to how many um, have tested positive in that ministry. The, there are other, we've been to a number of companies mm. where we've been told that no uh, um, 19 infection has been recorded there. But on the whole, um, from May to June, as we speak, We've been around to quite a number of um, workplaces. Mm. The Ministry of Employment issued um, a press release that the ministry will be embarking on an announced visit to various workplaces. Okay. And this began last week, continue, and even yesterday. We've been to quite a number of places. Okay. And, uh, the situation has not been the best. Okay. If you can. A few it... of them. Mm -hmm. are complying quite mm. well. Others oh. are not. And oh. the, the minister will be even joining us on this trip, on this visit, maybe tomorrow. Okay. Going. And uh, we will know um, what to do with those who are not complying with the protocols. Okay, so does it mean that for the companies that were not complying, the companies you visited mm -hmm. that were not complying, you didn't take any action against yeah. them? No, we didn't take any action there and then. But we ask them to put things in order. Okay. We will definitely have to come back next week. There will be another team that will go and then cross check all the recommendations that we give to them. Okay. For them to see whether they have adhered to those um, okay. advice that we've given to them. Yeah. All right. And if not, then there will be a next line of action all either right. to close them down or to prosecute them. All right. Did you visit that factory in Tema? That recorded about 500 cases and when you did what what happened what has been done yeah. so far yeah actually we were there we, we, we were there and we did a thorough examination and, and uh, uh, inspection of the whole premises we realized that just after that um they put in place is quite an elaborate protocol mm. to forestall any reoccurrence of the infection and uh, we'll be going there by next week again okay to see how they have sustained the protocols that they have put in place. But okay. for now, I think um, quite a number of measures have been taken and they are doing better than before. All right. I remember that your department also complained bitterly about lack of logistics. That was uh, impeding you know, work progress as, as well. So I want to find out, has that changed yeah. so far? Yeah, in in Accra, in a, in Accra, in Accra, it's 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 okay. It's better. Um, just this morning, my, my chief director um, spoke to his counterpart in the Ministry of Health, mm -hmm. who are going to supply us quite a number of things. Okay. I hope by close of day, we will you know take um, those. We will, we will receive those PPEs. I'm concerned about my officers outside Accra. They've also been visiting quite a number of uh, uh, um, workplaces, and they've sent reports to me, individual workplaces, what they are, uh, how they are faring, right, from uh, Takra, the uh, western region, eastern mm. region, Volta region, Ashanti region, the north and the upper east. And, uh, and outside Accra, um, the picture doesn't look too good. But Peter doesn't look too good. Mm. But we need to sustain the enforcement, the inspection. This will keep occupiers on their toes okay. and to sustain whatever protocols they have put in place. So we will need the PPE. So I, I hope by close of day, we will receive these PPEs and then send them to our officers um, in, the, in the regions so that they can continuously uh, monitor you know, mm. all these protocols at the, at the workplace. Are you saying then that you have not received any PPEs at all from government, or have you received some, but they were inadequate? And how many then did you receive? Well, as, as, uh, as, as a health and safety regulator, um, PPEs are part of us. We, we don't go on inspection without PPEs. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. we, 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 we are all, we was, 
the hazards are always there. Despite COVID-19, yeah, hazards are always there. We need to protect ourselves. So we, we have uh, you know, a number of PPEs, but this one, because of the infectious nature of the of the of the of the outbreak, yeah, we, we need disposable ones. You know, yeah, mm -hmm. we need disposable ones. So our our gown uh, uh, and then the nose mask uh, must be replenished. You know, uh, as okay. when necessary. That is why I said we would need more of these disposable uh, okay. PPEs. But PPEs are part of us. We always have our boots, uh, safety boots. We have our helmet. We have our shield. We have our goggles. We have our respirators, uh, nose masks. Okay. So as and when we go on inspection, we put them on. But this one, because of the the, 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 the nature of the of the hazard, mm -hmm. we will need to dispose of some of the PPEs and then get new ones every day and uh, you know as we so, do. So so do you on this special visit that we are going. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. Carry on. You were talking about a special on this, visit. On on yeah on, on this special uh, unannounced visit that we're going, the ministry has provided us with the PPE. Okay. And then we, we, we don done them every day as we go on this special how many we more would you going, need? Uh, we'll be meeting the minister to do. How many more PPEs well, we, would you we, need? We would need as many as yeah, the uh, nose marks and the, the shield, the gloves, and then the gown, the gown especially, because when you go into, uh, you know, to uh, um, uh, a location or a workplace that has been, you know, infected, mm -hmm. you really need to, you know, be fully uh, prepared, putting okay. on gown, face shield, and then respirators and gloves, you know, disposable. So okay. we, we need as many as we can, so that the other regions who can also you know, uh, receive these things and they can work effectively okay. in this. Uh, 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 yeah. mm -hmm. Mr. Mesa, when you talk about workplace, are you referring to factories or are you referring yeah. to all institutions? No, I'm referring to when I talk about workplace, I'm talking about factories, offices, and shops. Because earlier you had mentioned that yeah. you don't have any, um, you know, confirmed information that an institution had uh, confirmed COVID-19 patients there as well. So that's what I'm asking. Yeah. Because if that's the case, how come you yeah. don't have the reports to indicate how many of these institutions have tested uh, COVID-19 patients in their workplaces? Yeah, at the, at the moment, I, 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 will, I, will, I will receive this information from the ministry. It, it, this information doesn't come to uh, uh, GFI directly. Okay. It will go to the ministry and then the Before ministry will get it. available to us. So as of this morning, I've not received any information. So I will, I will, I will, I will meet the, the, the chief director. Okay. And maybe if there is any, uh, in fact, it was just this morning that the chief director told me there is a, a Ministry of Finance has shut down because mm. of, you know, um, such a problem. Okay, but so at least you saw the statements from Coco Board, they, from Ministry yes, of Finance. Yes. You've seen all those statements from BOST, Ministry of Finance, Cocoa Board. Exactly, exactly. You, okay. Exactly, exactly. Ministry of Finance, yeah, Cocoa Board, yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm. But all right. shut down. You, you can't go there to do any, any inspection, no. You so can't when go? when it's reopened, we'll visit these places and see whether they put in all the measures that they need to put in. Okay. Now, moving forward, since we are recording a number yeah. of cases in these various institutions, yeah. what are we doing to ensure that we reduce... Uh, you know, the possibility of infecting more yeah, people. Is, is, the, is the enforcement, is the, yeah, is, is, the, is the enforcement, you see, is the enforcement and educating the, the, the occupiers, you know. Um, you'll be surprised that, uh, uh, you know, a whole head of uh, a, a company is saying he has a, a philosophy, and that philosophy is that he's not sick, he, he has no symptoms, so there's no need to put on a mask, you see. But when we got there and we tried to educate him and talk to him, that's when he understood that mm. um, you don't know where it's coming from, you see. So you need to okay. protect yourself. You don't wait to get infected before you say you have to protect yourself. Okay. You know? So it's enforcement. It's that we need to go out there and then enforce the protocols, those who have not done it. Looking at a factory, about three or four factories in Kumasi, in fact, there, there is, when, when, when you look at the back, market, they don't mm -hmm. have temperature gun, they don't have. Um, signed it, they don't have safety posters they on COVID, they mm. don't have social distance was not there, you know, and it, it, it's, it's, it's worrying. But all these things is because we were there, we are able to identify all these things and advise them. We will go back again and then see whether they put in place all these protocols. If not, yeah. then we'll take a harsh, a, a harsh action. In the place. Okay. Either we'll clean the place or we'll take them to court. Okay. Yeah. 
All right. I wish you the very best then. And we'll get in touch with you later to find out after you have gone to inspect these other institutions so you can give us some more updates. Thank you so much. Mr. Frederick Ohinimensa is the Chief Inspector of Factories at the Department of Factories Inspectorate at the Ministry of Employment and Labor Relations. We've been speaking to him. Now, we'll also be speaking to Ibrahim Abubakar shortly to give us the latest updates from the KNUST Senior High School where a student passed on, unfortunately. But let's cross over now to Anita so she can um, give us some more information about Africa's case count. All right, so um, let's go to Nigeria where 29,700 and 89 confirmed cases have been recorded and in Nigeria over 152,000 tests have been conducted as well and with flights set to resume in that country on the African continent. Now if politicians are traveling, their aides or people who accompany them uh, when things were normal are not going to be allowed to follow the uh, politicians or presidential staffers who are going on trips and so the aides and other people who accompany them now in you know ways to curb the spread of the virus especially at the airports that is what the aviation minister in Nigeria has put across and then down here in Ghana we are the fourth highest in Africa with 21,968 confirmed cases and the last update stated that 891 new cases have been recorded. And then let's go to Algeria, where 16,879 cases have been confirmed. And on the recovery scale, we have 246,320 recoveries in Africa. And when it comes to countries that are doing well in that parameter, we have South Africa with over 102,299 recoveries. That is pretty, pretty impressive. And Egypt with 21,718, Ghana with 17,156, Nigeria 12,108 recoveries, and then Algeria with 12,094. Our deaths on the continent is rather soaring as barely two, three months ago, we were around 2,000. And, you know, a lot of aspects were saying that the deaths on the continent was on the low side, which was uh, better but uh, it looks like it's really soaring and on monday it was a little over ten thousand. but this morning we have twelve thousand and seven. south africa is leading in this parameter with three thousand five hundred and two egypt with three thousand four hundred and eighty nine algeria with nine hundred and sixty eight and then nigeria with six hundred and sixty nine i always keep saying that it is only in this parameter that you have to find ghana down there somewhere which is really good now let's look at certain interesting stuff that are happening on the global scale in terms of COVID-19 and as always the Johns Hopkins Coronavirus Resource Center is the go-to place and the United States is still leading with 2.9 million very close to the 3 million mark wow very very sad uh, situation if you ask me but uh, the total number of confirmed cases on the global scale is 11,839,095. And the United States with 2,996,098. And when it comes to the United States, uh, states such as Florida, Arizona are contributing the highest. As even in Florida, their hospitals have been overwhelmed to the extent that some have to even close down in terms of taking more people in. And so that is it for the United States. And I'm sure by the end of the day, that 3 million mark would have been uh, passed already. Now let's go to Brazil. And from yesterday, Brazil has been in the news. And I mean, since COVID-19 began, Brazil is always in the news because of your president and his supporters. And finally, uh, he's contracted COVID-19. He went through the, text, the, the test a couple of times and he, it came out negative. So he thought that, okay, this is just a small flu that has been exaggerated. But now... He has experienced the symptoms that is coughing and some fever here and there, but he still thinks that it's still a small flu. But yesterday during his address, uh, you know, in an interview and then talking to press men and then putting it out there that now he has COVID-19, he now had a mask on. So why wait till you get the virus before you start putting all the protocols in place? And I think this is a wake up call for all of us. If you're at home and you're not adhering to the protocols and thinking that it's something that has just been exaggerated, you can't get infected. This is still COVID-19 360. We are taking a break at this point. When we come back, there's more. Do stay. All right. Welcome back. So it's still COVID-19 360. And Ibrahim Abubakar has joined us again earlier uh, this morning. He gave us some updates. And we're coming back to find out 
if there's any more, um, you know, for us. And so, Ibrahim, welcome back. Thank you, Bella. All right. So earlier, you mentioned that the GA Secretariat had uh, arrived at the school, and we are all waiting for some information about that. What's happening so far? Well, so, um, Bella, I can tell you that they are so in a closed zone meeting. The regional education director is here together with her officials. So they are meeting the student leadership and management of the school together with the um, security department. So they've been there in the meeting and they told us it's a closed door. So we are waiting for them to finish and okay. um, access on the outcome. But at the moment, calm has returned, as you can see. Mm. And the atmosphere is a bit calm now. But classes are not in session. Some of the students are just loitering about. So that is the situation here. We, we spoke to the deputy police commander some few minutes ago, the COP at Gemma, and he told us that and they withdraw some of their police personnel here because a number of them are here armed and unarmed. So mm. for now, they've spoken to the student leadership. They also address the students and themselves. So they withdraw some of the security okay. and leave some behind. But if this continues and the students continue to demonstrate, then they wouldn't have any option than to advise or accept to uh, maybe close down the school because they don't have that authority. Okay. Whatever they have, they need to advise and consult with the mm. regional school. All right. The regional but, school okay, but when you got to campus, you mentioned that you had been able to speak to some teachers uh, as well as the headmistress as well. Am I right? Ibrahim? Yes. Okay, so what did you get from them? So um, they were narrating. Ibrahim. Okay. Uh, well. and the, the disease. All right. Sorry, you have to come again because we lost you at a point. So tell us what happened when you interacted okay. with the teachers. So what they told me was that um, the person who had died was mm. a day student because of his condition. He, he has ulcer. So okay. he was a day student and also a final year student doing business. And because the president directed that all the students should be important, he was also brought here. Mm. But he has that too. And anytime um, he suffers from the altar, they call the parents in to come and take him. So they knew his condition already. So when it happened on Monday, they called the parents. But initially in the morning, they told me that the parents came and take him on Monday. Mm -hmm. But later then, I heard was that the parents rather came yesterday to pick him. So it was yesterday evening that he died. That's why the students are agitated. Mm. But even on Monday, when he was sick, they even told the authorities that they would volunteer and send him to the nearest health facility. Yeah. But they did not. You come to this place too, they don't have a sick day, they don't have an isolation center. And Bella, one thing I will say is that when the president was opening the school, one mm -hmm. thing he said that was that because they don't want the spread of the virus, so everybody will be involved. In mm -hmm. And in addition to that, like every senior high school must allocate a block at an isolation center, and they will bring health officials to man this facility. You come here, there is no isolation center. I spoke to management, and they told me that find the student, uh, the president directed that, day, but they were also waiting on GS uh -huh. to come and in the health facility so that they will know which block will be suitable for the isolation center. So they, they've not had anything. So they don't have anything like isolation center yet. They don't have a okay. city. That's why they, they have to call your parents wherever they are, come and pick you. And but, send you home. but the authorities also mentioned that they were mapping the institutions, the schools, to some uh, hospitals in the various districts and you know communities as well. Were they not aware of that? And which hospital were they marked to? Well, they, they have not been able to tell me which hospital. But for this one, I'm sure it will be the KNUSD hospital because it is closer. And KNUSD hospital is one of the hospitals that have been marked. And they even conduct some of the testing. So they may be under KNUSD hospital. 
But the challenge, so the information is not even forthcoming, even from the management. Mm -hmm. We were just brief. So, and even with regards to the isolation center, I'm even waiting for the meeting to end. Then I'll pose the question to the GS director because it is also their duty to ensure that mm -hmm. the president direct are being adhered to. So exactly. Okay, people should do A, B, C. You must also monitor to ensure that it is being done. So, if they are not doing it, then you have to question them. So, meaning the the blame should come from both uh, management, government, GES, because the management, I'm sure if they didn't want me to know about the isolation, they wouldn't mm. have told me. But that's the first information they gave me. Okay. That isolation. All right. I saw, I saw a tweet where a student was trying to explain what led to the exacerbation of the student's condition. And he said that there was no food on campus uh, at that time. And so they decided to give him some drink. And they suspect that it was probably the sugary content that, you know, escalated the issue. Have you been able to interact with the students about this? And is it true? Well, uh, I've interacted with a couple, a couple of the students. Some are saying exactly what you are saying. Some too um, did not say that. Then I inquired from the management. They told me they have a lot of food stock here. In fact, I went to the dining um, this morning. I saw some of them eating, even though they were still protesting. Mm. And instantly, and one sad event that even happened. Some of the students had to pounce on their colleagues and beat him because they, they said he was there learning whilst they are here demonstrating. So they want everybody to, to be part of the demonstration so that it will be a collective action. But um, they showed me their full stock uh, vaccine. Food there. So I don't know exactly what has been, whether at that particular moment, because you know, when you are on campus, food is being served morning, afternoon, and evening. Exactly. So between afternoon, if you've eaten your breakfast already, um, you wouldn't be given any food until. So mm. maybe me, if you are extra, and so in condition, that's it. So that's where we can even say it's in, indeed true that he was having ulcer. And you know these people, they have have to be eating. I'll say constantly, not much. So mm. and you know food vendors also allowed on campus, and you are also not allowed to go out. So that's where the challenge. Okay. Now, now during the time that you wish, it's morning after. When did the students exactly start the demonstration? Was it last night? And. Uh, you mentioned that you were there. Did you notice if any of them were not wearing their nose masks? Yeah, they started last night. But last night, fortunately, the police intervened quickly and they were able to contain the situation and calm them. So it, last night, before I got here, I was at the gate. I saw them demonstrating. Before I got here, they've been dispersed. Okay. But this morning, after the demonstration, I would say most of them were in nose masks. Mm -hmm. Some were not. So we literally have to even advise them that fine. In as much as you are sending your grievances out, you are demonstrating, you need to also protect yourself because your life matters. Yeah. So we have to even force to put on the nose mask. Others who ignore them, they were just doing what they, they were doing. So some of them were able to put them to put it. Others too, we told them and they ignore even my So you know you will be fighting for your and you may end up even contracting them. Mm. Because a lot of people campus today, not just students, a lot of people, both media men and um, some, well, I've not seen any parents here yet. Okay. I don't know. Well, I, I've just been told that they've closed the gate, so some of the parents uh, are outside. behind it. Okay, so they okay. Want access inside. Because, like I said, even in the morning when I spoke to some of them, some had the fear in them. They wanted to go home because they say they cannot come to school just to write their wasi and their cops will be sent home. And they were also claiming, this is a claim that we've not verified. Mm. So that is where the issue of um, spirituality too is coming. Mm -hmm. They are saying here alone, seven students, final year students have died. In, in 2020 or since they reopened? They are saying 2020. Okay. So, seven. That one we've not been able to confirm because the time they made the allegation, the meeting had already been. So, we also have to find out 
they were saying they died in a mysterious circumstance, then they all died on that Tuesday, and all of them were fired yesterday. So hmm. that's why some of the things were even re what exactly was going What's on. Going so on. Okay. most of them were for the head of the headmistress, and they want a change of management. But that one will be decided, the meeting with the okay. management and the leadership. All yes. right. Thank you so much, uh, Ibrahim Abubakar. And I believe you are still waiting for some more updates as they conclude the meeting with the GS. So I'm sure later in the day, TV3 will connect with you again. Thank you so much. Ibrahim Abubakar is our correspondent from the Ashanti region. And yes, it still is COVID-19 360. When we come back, we'll speak to Dr. Bertha Sewa Aye, and we have some more coming up. All right, welcome back. It's still COVID-19 360. We've been joined by Dr. Bertha Sewa Ayi, who is an infectious disease specialist, and Dr. Newman Arthur, uh, who is a clinical psychologist. Good morning to both of you, and I hope you're well. Can you hear me, Doc? Um, not, not very well. Okay, I'm going to try and project, at least for now. So, Dr. Yeah. Bertha, earlier we spoke yeah. to Dr. Newman about the issue happening um, at KNUST SHS. I want to find out what you think as well, because um, a student apparently was suffering from uh, complications from ulcer, and the teacher stood by apparently because they were too scared to come close because they didn't know if he had COVID-19 or not. All this has not been confirmed yet. We're still waiting for a statement from the institution and from Ghana Education Service. Um, Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. But I think it broke a little bit. Okay, what I'm saying is, so a student has died at the KNUST Senior High School. And this student apparently, I mean, in a video, looked like he was suffering from what could be ulcer. It's not been confirmed by doctors yet what led to his death. But the teachers in the video as well were not attending to the student. They stood far away because apparently they were concerned that the student might have COVID-19. And so as it stands now, there's no official statements from the school because they are having a meeting with the Ghana Education Service Secretariat in the Ashanti region. And so we're yet to hear from them. But what do you make of this? Uh, we're tying this conversation into uh, the reopening of schools for final year students and how some institutions had asked that we close it down because it was a bad idea. Well, I think that it's pretty simple. What they need to do, and probably every school, is that they need to have like an emergency plan on what to do if a student falls ill or what to do if a student passes out like this. Is there someone, sort of like we have in the hospitals where if somebody um, gets short of breath or shows any signs of dying or respiratory distress, immediately there are steps to follow, call for help, dial this number, call the hospital operator type of thing. I think something like that will have to be put in every school so that as soon as the, the, somebody falls down like that, both the students and teachers know exactly what to do. This is the number we have to call. This is where we can find um, something protective to wear, grab, put it on, and attend to the patient. Because um, not attending to him at all and watching that child die um, it's unfortunate. I haven't seen the video, but I mean, I think clearly there was likely a lack of a plan as to what to do in such a situation. And also, and, and some of, sorry, some of these events become process improvements. I mean, it's unfortunate, but it becomes a point for process improvement where every school will evaluate and decide that this is a thing that we have to put in place. Okay. Now, we're also getting from our correspondent who is currently at the school that the school does not have an isolation center. Um, they don't have any emergency center. And there was a directive by the president uh, upon the reopening of schools to ensure that all these schools have these centers just in case we record a case. And the school authorities, from what our correspondent is saying, is that they were also waiting for the Ghana Education Service to let them know which hospital they were uh, mapped to and which of the buildings to use for an isolation center. All that was not done. Who should we blame at this moment? Um, I didn't hear the last part of what you said, but my sense was, I believe that the head teachers may have met with a government official and they reassured the president that they were ready and that they've identified the places for isolation. 
and maybe given a list of the hospitals close by. Um, so I don't know if that in itself is, is an excuse because um, if you live somewhere or if your school is situated somewhere, you know the closest facility where you can send a, pa um, a, a patient versus, mm. you know, somebody who lives, who is in their office um, somewhere. Exactly. I okay. Your question, but I got well, a big chunk of what you said. Yeah, what I was saying was that um, an interaction with the authorities uh, indicated that they were waiting for the Ghana Education Service to confirm to the school authorities which of the buildings to use for an isolation center and for an emergency center. And because they didn't get that, that's why they don't have a center, just in case a student tests positive. Who should we blame at this point? Um, I think, I don't think it's even an opportunity to blame anyone per se, but we have to assess the situation and allow everybody to take some personal responsibility. Running this country, we elect a government because we, we trust them, and then we let them take some major decisions for us. It doesn't exclude any one individual from taking corrective action. Um, being empowered still is part of being a citizen. Mm. Just be responsible. You don't have to wait. Like, the government does not have to come and clean your gutters, put food on your table, or do everything for you. Communities can fix their own roads and at least take some personal responsibility. So I, I don't want to apportion blame, but I would rather say that this is an opportunity for people to learn that running... The, the government is made out of people who've been elected and citizens. It's the people and the government. So if you are part of the people, you have to be responsible. Mm. Okay. And Dr. Newman, let me bring you in here. Now let's talk about institutions. Again, the trade minister during one of the press briefings mentioned that the workplaces could be a hub for, um, you know, for COVID-19 infections. And down the line, we've seen a number of statements from various institutions confirming, um, you know, that they have recorded some cases as well. But what do you make of this and how is this going to affect workers moving on, knowing that I'm, I have to work? but it's not a safe space for me. Uh, the, I think that for, for this, this pandemic, I think it's one of the easiest to control because I think currently we know exactly what it does and the impact is not like other pandemics. And so uh, I find it quite hard that we're still struggling to make a headway with, with controlling uh, you know, things. If, if, if we decide we will follow what we have to follow, I think this should be one of the easiest to control. And thankfully, it is not really killing as many people as we were expecting. And so it should be easier. So I think that even for workplaces, now there are a lot of workers who work from home and it's easier for them to work from home. There are all kinds of things that can be done you know, in, in the house. So I think that at this point, they should be very creative as to what exactly they can do you know, a, a limiting contact with people. Because so far as people gather, it is easy for, for, for things to, to get out of hand. And also, I would say that uh, workers should be responsible for everything that goes on with them. So if you go to a certain working environment and you realize that they're not doing what they're supposed to do, you should be able to raise some, some concerns and be able to make uh, and ensure that things are done the way they are supposed to, to be done. Because I think this is very, very easy to control. I, I find it very, very hard that we're still struggling to know what to do. <laughs> you know, for what is even happening in the schools. We shouldn't be struggling to know what to do. Because we know what to do. Mm. Just that someone has to be committed to do what to do. Because if we are waiting for things to happen before we seek a psychologist or we start talking about how to maximize this and maximize that, yeah. it's late. And so okay. that, that is what I think. I find it very, very difficult to understand why we are still struggling to do what is obvious we, we need to do. Okay. Now, looking at a situation where our test results are delaying, um, you know, and we also have these new discharge protocols, there are a lot of tests that are being done in these institutions. And sometimes you're not even able to tell whether after you've tested for COVID-19 and you're waiting for the results, you should stay at home and self-quarantine or you should continue going to work. And so by the time your results come, which probably might take another two weeks or three weeks, 
what do you do? I mean, if I have to go to work and still ensure that my work is being done and I end up infecting more people, I mean, what, what's going to be done about that? Dr. Bertha, maybe you can come in here. Because this right. obviously um, is also leading to infections, um, you know, in the institutions, right? Right. And, and, and there is some new information, Bella, in the last three days that may help different institutions. Um, about 200 and maybe 60 or 200 plus um, scientists got together and they have penned an open letter to the Clinical Infectious Disease Journal, mm. I believe, um, and also to the WHO, addressing the fact that maybe airborne transmission is a lot um, higher than people thought, meaning there's a lot more aerosolized transmission than we think instead of just the droplets requiring masks. Mm -hmm. Now, what this means for institutions and workplaces especially since most people are opening, is that we should be opening more windows and doors. What it means is that an aerosol is something, any droplet that's less than five microns, and just to put it in perspective, one strand of your hair is about 50 microns, so about a tenth of the size of the strand of your hair is these fine droplets that are carrying the virus. So it goes beyond the protection by the mask. It means the thing is in the air, and in an enclosed room can hang for up to three hours. So what the group is pushing for is that open as many windows as you can. If you are in a small room, and if you are in a small room, keep the doors open if you can. If you are in an air-conditioned room, you might have to check with um, your air-conditioned specialist to see what they can to reduce air recirculating in a room. And I think it also explains why the meat packing plants in the United States, for example, mm. and the factory that had the outbreak with 500 people in the Tema area were getting infections because they've looked and looked and looked and they've tried to explain why these outbreaks are occurring, even in situations where the people were not in very close contact with the index person. And it yeah. seems to be it's because there's some airborne um, transmission. Hmm. So, so far as the tests are concerned, yes, they may be backed up, but I think these are, the group mentioned that these are simple, no cost, zero cost interventions that people can put in place to reduce the risk of transmission. Because as you can see, the world is recording more and more cases. WHO reported that just one weekend alone, they reported 400,000 cases. Well, at the beginning of the outbreak, it took 12 weeks before we recorded 400,000. So yeah. we are in that epidemic part of the curve. And whatever we can learn and do to reduce transmission is important. Okay. Now, talking about the number of days that have led to the increase, we recorded our first two cases on the 12th of March. It took 100 days for us to record about 12,000 cases. Now, we've almost doubled that number in just 20 days. So were we too quick as a country to pat our back, uh, you know, our backs and say that we've managed this situation well and a lot of other countries are looking up to us because of how we have managed our situation? Because we allow people to go back out um, after a partial lockdown, which lasted only two weeks. And, you know, schools are open. Um, we've stopped mass testing as well. So were we too quick and, you know, making some of these judgments? Well, I don't think we were too quick. I mean, we did deserve a pat on the back. It's like going to school the first few weeks, you do really well. If you've done well, you've done well. I think the pat on the back was necessary. Is the student keeping up with the hard work which they started with? We don't have to give up. Um, we, I, one, I think the lockdown was removed too quickly at three weeks. And mm. between the lockdown and now, in 77 days, we've the, the cases have gone 20 times from where they were. So I think that we need to keep up with, we shouldn't stop mass testing. But my understanding is because we don't have enough reagents. So yeah. that's a different matter. We need to find a way of logistically um, solving that problem. But our hands don't have to get tired. We don't have to be weak. We know based on Italy, based on China, based on countries that kept up the good fight, um, that we can win, we can win this war. Like Europe has opened up now. So um, if I'm to quote the Bible, it says, um, "Don't let your hands be weak." You know, yeah. fight the good fight of faith. I believe, I strongly believe that if you keep up with 
what we're doing, we would win them. Mm. Dr. Newman, do you also share the same sentiments? Uh, I think so. And I think we should be able to work out everything in our minds as to exactly what we're going to do, you know, in, in various situations. That kind of rehearsal preparation doesn't, it doesn't leave any stone unturned. I think we should be able to work that in our minds so that we know exactly what to do in, in whichever situations we may find ourselves, especially in our schools. Because if that doesn't happen, we're, we're going to record higher cases in the coming, in the coming days. All right. So what advice would you give to us as we move along so we can wrap up? And Dr. Beth, I'll come to you about the essay competition shortly. Yeah, we, we, we should stay calm, but, but we should do what we have to do. And if, until we do that, we, we don't expect to have another, another kind of results. If we don't do what we are supposed to do, we are going to see, you know, uh, we, we are not going to see what we want to see. So mm. we, should keep, we should keep calm, but we should do what we have to do. And Absolutely. that's the way forward. Okay. Now, uh, I mean, we're taking advantage of COVID-19 to also test people's intelligence as much as possible. And this is all courtesy Dr. Betha Sewa Ai. So, Dr. Betha, tell us about this essay competition that's coming up. Oh, okay. Yeah. So, this is an essay competition sponsored by um, a non-profit Global Infectious Disease Institute. And um, I will be hosting it. Okay. Um, essentially, the rationale is that I feel the voices of children have been quiet in this epidemic. Um, the adults have been talking a lot how it's affecting them, but recently I've been speaking to some young people and apparently some of them are anxious. Um, they're not sure what their future is going to be. They see a lot of adults out of jobs. They're not sure if they're going to get jobs. And you have little ones who this is affecting in different ways. So this is an opportunity for children to share how COVID-19 has impacted them. Um, they're supposed to write a poem or an essay with a 500-word limit, meaning you can write 20 words, 100 words, 200 words, and you are supposed to share, be creative, be original, be honest, no lies, don't make up a story. Talk about how COVID-19 has affected your life. For some people, it's affected them positively. They are spending more time with their families. Others have had a bad um, outcome out of this. We just want to hear it. And so there are three age categories, three to eight, nine to 12, and then 13 to 19. Um, you submit your entry to TV at gmail.com. Mm. And just make sure there's a parent's phone number and email of somebody who is willing to appear with you. And on the 18th of July and July 25th, um, we'll, we'll select five entries from each of these categories okay the three to eight and nine to twelve year olds would um would be selected on july 18th and uh the teenagers would be speaking on july 25th uh, we we'll okay. hope to have five people and the top three the first will receive a 150 dollar equivalent maybe in ghana cities or whichever country the second in each category will receive a hundred dollars Okay. And the third will receive $50. And it's open to any child in any part of the world. So we're hoping that as many children who hear about this would want to write and tell us about how the um, disease has affected them. And even if you don't win, at least you'd have gotten a chance to express yourself and for the world to know when all this was going on as a child, what was happening to you in your own little world. Absolutely. So they can send that email um, to, if you can give us the address again, please. Um, it's D-R-B-E-R-T-H-A-T-B -E at gmail.com. Okay. Thank you so much. And um, I hope that a lot of children will uh, also jump on board. Uh, but we'll keep talking yeah. about this as much as possible until um, it's over and until you receive as many entries as possible. And so thank oh, yeah. you. And the deadline to submit is Sunday morning. Oh, um, just the Sunday. Sunday morning, yes. Yeah. So you have five days to put your thoughts together and okay. submit. Okay. All right. We'll all take part then. Thank you so much, Dr. Betha Sewai and Dr. Niman Arthur. Thank you. Always a pleasure speaking to you. Thank you. All right. So it's still COVID-19-360. We'll be reading some of your messages. So if you haven't sent yours yet, you know what to do. Send us a WhatsApp or you can find us on social media at TV3 Ghana, Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. It's COVID-19-360. We'll be back with you. All right, you're welcome back. It's still COVID-19, 360, and now it's time for some news updates. Let's find out what's happening.
in the rest of the world in regards, uh, with regards to COVID-19. Welcome to news update on COVID-19 360. Kenya continues to battle the COVID-19 pandemic with cases steadily rising each day. Primary and secondary school students in Kenya will only return to school in 2021, the Education Ministry announced on Tuesday. Subsequently, terminal exams for both levels, the Kenya Primary Certificate Exams and the Kenya Secondary Certificate Exams, have also been cancelled. The decision is based on the evolution of the coronavirus pandemic in the East African country. There are over 8,000 confirmed cases as of June 6. President Kenyatta on the same day announced the partial lifting of a curfew on hotspots whilst a number of restrictions were also eased. In Nigeria, the 2020 West African School Certificates Examination is to be taken by 1,549,463 candidates in 19,129 centers nationwide. The head of Nigeria National Office of the organization, Patrick Iregan, has disclosed in Lagos. He added that the test, which holds between August 4 and September 5, would run daily from Monday to Saturday. In deference to existing COVID-19 protocols, the HNO said schools must provide wash hand buckets with running water, soaps, hand sanitizers and thermometer handgun to check the temperature of all concerned. Arigan asserted that the council would adhere strictly to physical distancing in the examination halls by ensuring the candidates sit two meters apart. Mumbai, one of India's biggest coronavirus hotspots, has become the country's first city to open up testing to everyone. Until now, complex rules have meant that testing was mostly restricted to those who have symptoms or are high risk and required a doctor's prescription. But Mumbai, which has some 86,500 confirmed cases, has done away with that. It's also allowing all labs, including private ones, to do the test. The government has already fixed prices. The move comes as India ramps up testing. Case numbers have already surged in recent weeks as a result. The World Health Organization has acknowledged there is emerging evidence that the coronavirus can be spread by a tiny particle suspended in the air. The airborne transmission could not be ruled out in crowded, closed or poorly ventilated settings, an official said. If the evidence is confirmed, it may affect guidelines for indoor spaces. An open letter from more than 200 scientists had accused the World Health Organization of underestimating the possibility of airborne transmission. Today, the World Health Organization admitted there was evidence to suggest this was possible in specific settings such as enclosed and crowded spaces. Interesting the decision that Kenya has taken concerning reopening of schools in 2021. I wonder what's going to happen um, within that period. I'm sure e-learning still takes place. but. I, I, I'm guessing that a lot of people would now start saying that, okay, maybe we could have adopted that as well. I know. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, Anita. Well, I'll be surprised if people start adopting that as yeah. well. But your messages have been coming in, and this one says he's not surprised about the SHS student incident because he was on quarantine when nurses were taking their blood samples and a colleague collapsed. And what the nurses did was to step back while he personally approached him to wake him up before calling on a doctor to arrive at the scene. And he is uh, Karim. And uh, I would have wanted to know which particular hospital or where exactly this happened. So Karim, if you can send us another message. And this one says, hi, this is Big Attack from uh, Kadi. Ghana's case count uh, stands to be unbearable. Okay, okay. Hi, I'm Matilda from Ashaman. Will students come back home due to the COVID-19 pandemic in schools? Uh, that is with regard to the Accra Girls Senior High School. Okay. A very tragic incident. The school authorities ought to bring to book or they have to be brought to book for acting idle leading to the demise of our beloved son. Sincere condolences to the demise's uh, family. And that is coming from uh, Segabi in Achimbegro. Good morning, Bella and Anita. And thank you, TV3, for this educative and informative program. Welcome back, Anita, once again. <laughs> thank you. Well, I went nowhere. So you have elevated the bar. Oh, God. Um, this one says, the COVID-19 pandemic seriously needs to be taken seriously and not treated as a mere fiction or storytelling. We are at war with a deadly enemy, which will stop at nothing until we give up the fight. So let us continue to look after ourselves while observing the necessary safety protocols and end the spread of COVID-19. That is coming from BAO Kansi. Good morning, Bella. Please, can you find out for me how safe it is to sleep on a hotel bed? I think Dr. Uh, Bertha oh, okay. will, will have to answer that. It depends I on thought, which hotel you're asking me. I'm, if, I'm not sure what to say. 
<laughs> Maybe he's asking if you've slept on a hotel bed okay, recently. I so don't it's know. <laughs> well, okay. This one says, Hi, Anita. I just want to know if incoming level 100 students will go to school this year because they have already bought their forms. And in case they don't go to school this year, is their forms going to go to waste? Or because we're not getting any information about that, and that is coming from Nanadra inside in Kariye. I love watching COVID 360 on TV3, the best of all TV stations in Ghana. Love you, Bella and Anita. That is coming from Kevin in Tema Newtown. We love you too, Kevin. Anita, this issue about our students is becoming serious day in, day out. Hmm. Hi, I'm a teacher at a basic school. We were given one nose mask only, no sanitizer. So if there's a case like the one at KNUST SHS, do you blame the teacher? Um, you know, who doesn't have any PPE to go forward, I think the schools must be closed again. Hmm. I don't even know why we are rushing to open schools in Ghana. Are we the only country affected by this pandemic? Or are we better than countries who are uh, still closing schools? How can we be experimenting with human life? God save us. And that is coming from Almighty in Ashaman. Okay, these large schools need qualified one or two nurses on campus and doctors who are... Uh, who at least come around, uh, you know, in a week. And also, first aid must be taught in schools. Okay. Good morning, TV3. More grace uh, for the good work done, please. The whole country is not doing well when it comes to isolation centers. I'm a nurse, and it's serious when it comes to PPEs and isolation centers. I think the schools should be closed. GES should bring courses online for them to learn and go write the exam. Hospitals are not well prepared. How much more schools? Please, let's close the schools now. And that is coming from Adubia. Well, she says she's, she's a nurse. So coming from here, that should be out of experience. Okay. How sad seeing teachers leave students to die instead of taking care of them. This COVID-19 thing is getting out of hands. Therefore, we need to act fast. And is, is it there were ignorance or insolence in taking... Okay, that, that is not quite clear. I think you have to come again. But that is coming from... Kwame Blay inside the CMA. I think maybe what he's trying to say is about oh, more of ignorance. Yeah, yeah. And insolence as well. Is yeah. that where it's taking us to? Yeah. Like, okay, okay. Okay, so what? now the hashtag is hashtag students lives matter. Uh, hashtag SLM. Okay, I look forward to seeing that on Twitter <laughs> as well. Hi, please. I'm Akia from Medina. Please, a woman that just uh, spoke about the impact of COVID-19 on us and we writing an essay on it. I don't really understand her. I guess Bella can give us a better understanding of what Dr. Bertha is trying to do with regard to the essay competition. Okay, so let me just get the information here so I can just reiterate for you. So it says here um, that there's an essay contest sponsored by Global Infectious Disease Institute and Dr. Bertha. And the deadline for submission is Sunday, the 7th of July, uh, 6 a.m. in Ghana. So these are the guidelines. Your topic should be on how COVID-19 has impacted your life. And you're supposed to write a 500-word limit essay or poem. Note that this is the maximum. It can be as short as 20, 100, or 200 words, but maximum should be uh, 500 words. And you can add an email or a phone number of the name or parent or guardian who will be present with you on July 18th or at least agree to allow you to participate in the contest and verify your age. Submit your entry to Dr. Bertha TV. So D-R-B-E-R-T-H-A-T-V at gmail.com. And uh, the eligibility criteria, children aged 3 to 19 years of age, living in any country at all, can partake. So 3 to 8 years is one category. 9 to 12 years will be another category. And 13 to 19 years. First prize is $150. Second prize is $100. And third prize is $50. Okay, so this one was also asking about yeah, more information about the contest. So there you have it. This one says, Hi, Bella and Anita. I don't understand why TV3 has stopped the sensitization on COVID-19 in various languages. Knowing our illiteracy level in the country, I think the sensitization level in our various languages should be increased rather. Well, that is why Onia TV yeah. has uh, COVID-19 in Como. So if you want it in the local language, just watch Onia TV. That's from 9 to 10, I think, with Asempa and... So yeah. they go in depth when it comes to the local language and everything that has to do with COVID-19 in, uh, you know, the chi, in Chi, right? Exactly. So Onya TV is the best place to be. But once in a while, Bella and I will try and speak a little bit of Chi and then go for you. But I think it's been a while. How do you say nose mask? Google mama. Google mama. How do you say nose mask? Google mama. How do you say nose mask?
Anyway, just make sure that you're adhering to the safety protocols and we'll continue to educate you in all the languages as much as possible. Thank you for tuning in. We'll be back tomorrow at 10 a.m. right here on TVP. <laughs> <laughs>